Hello, my name is Vaughan Roberts. I am team rector of Warwick, the team vicar of St. Mary's and chaplain to our present high sheriff of Warwickshire, Joe Greenwell. It's my privilege to welcome you to the High Sheriff's online legal service in these unusual and challenging times. Even now, it's fitting that a small number of us are gathering in church to offer our thanksgiving to God. Not only have monarchy, law and faith been closely intertwined throughout our nation's history, we can also see these vital elements of our society have a heritage extending back into biblical times. The story told in scripture continues to shape our society alongside such important concepts as justice, peace, and the common good, which have their roots in this shared history. So it is good to welcome you to the High Sheriff of Warwickshire and his service along with the Bishop of Warwick here in St. Mary's as we record a socially distanced service with contributions along with those who are recording their words at an even greater distance and sharing them with us today. We begin by praying for all involved in the administration of justice for our locality, which is followed by the High Sheriff's Prayer. So let us pray. Almighty God, Enthroned in glory and judge of all, we humbly beseech thee to bless all concerned with justice throughout this land. Give to them thy spirit of wisdom and understanding, that they may discern truth and impartially administer the law through thy grace and mercy. In your holy name we pray. Amen. And the High Sheriff's Prayer. Lord, may we, thy servants who seek to do thy work, be rulers first of ourselves. Give us, we pray, the strength to do our duty and grant us in all things a sense of humour and a quiet mind, for thy sake, the source of all good gifts. Amen. Thank you, Reverend Vaughan, and thank you to everybody involved here at St. Mary's for their help in putting this virtual legal service together. Thank you also to Bishop John for all his support and for agreeing to address us today. This service traditionally takes place in October and is attended by, among others, the Lord Lieutenant, the Judiciary, representatives from the police, emergency services, the military, civic leaders and representatives from many charities drawn from across the county. It is a grand occasion, with St Mary's hosting a congregation of 500 plus. The purpose of the annual legal service is to give thanks and offer prayers to those agencies and organisations I've mentioned for their service to our communities. Such recognition has probably never been more appropriate and deserved. As High Sheriff, I pay tribute in particular, of course, to the work of our judges, court staff, our police service, fire and ambulance service, the coroner and his staff, prison and probation services. The postponement of the service as a result of the pandemic does give us an opportunity to reflect today on the extraordinary challenges of the last 12 months and the remarkable response from all our frontline services. We shall be helped in this today with contributions from Chief Constable Martin Jelly and Glenn Burley, Chief Executive South Warwickshire Foundation Trust, Y Valley NHS Trust and George Elliott Hospital NHS Trust. During my Shrievalty, I've come across many examples of outstanding leadership, a determination to maintain the highest standards of public service despite the constraints imposed by the pandemic and a willingness to go above and beyond the call of duty. This is often called for creativity and flexibility, a can-do attitude and a mindset of what more can we do to help. This approach has been evident too within the business community and in our county, borough, district, town and parish council offices where community support groups have been established 
in our towns and villages to help those in need, often working with local volunteer groups, many of which have sprung up to do great work as well as established charities. Challenges remain, of course, though there is a realistic prospect for a return to something like normality in the months to come. When that time comes, we should not forget the institutions, their leadership, and the community spirit which have sustained us throughout this most difficult time. Lord of wonderfulness, Lord of all joy, whose trust ever childlike no curse could destroy, be there at our waking and give us, we pray, your bliss in our hearts. The first reading is taken from Exodus, chapter 18, verse 13 to 27. The next day Moses sat as judge for the people, while the people stood around him from morning until evening. When Moses' father-in-law saw all that he was doing for the people, he said, What is this that you are doing for the people? Why do you sit alone while all the people stand around you from morning until evening? Moses said to his father-in-law, because the people come to me to inquire of God. When they have a dispute, they come to me, and I decide between one person and another, and I make known to them the statutes and instructions of God. Moses' father-in-law said to him, what you are doing is not good. You will surely wear yourself out, both you and these people with you, for the task is too heavy for you. You cannot do it alone. Now listen to me. I will give you counsel, and God be with you. You should represent the people before God, and you should bring their cases before God. Teach them the statutes and instructions, and make known to them the way they are going to go and the things they are to do. You should also look for able men among all the people, men who fear God, are trustworthy, and hate dishonest gain. Set such men over them as officers over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Let them sit as judges for the people at all times. Let them bring every important case to you, but decide every minor case themselves, so it will be easier for you, and they will bear the burden with you. If you do this, and God so commands you, then you will be able to endure 
and all these people will go to their home in peace. So Moses listened to his father-in-law and did all that he had said. Moses chose able men from all Israel and appointed them as heads over the people, as officers over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. And they judged the people at all times. Hard cases they brought to Moses, but any minor case they decided themselves. Then Moses let his father-in-law depart, and he went off to his own country. The second reading is taken from Matthew, chapter 22, verses 34 to 40. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. One of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him, saying, Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. We've all just come through what can only be described as the most extraordinary 12-month period. The response to the COVID pandemic in Warwickshire, I think, has in many respects brought out the very best of what our fine county has to offer. The partnerships that have come together and been forged in support of the NHS response have done a sterling job. So the county councils, the district and boroughs, the Local Resilience Forum, the Emergency Services, Public Health England, and of course, our volunteers and charities in the county who stepped into the breach and have been out there visiting, looking after the most vulnerable, often shielded people in our society. 
And of course, I'm hugely proud of the police's response as part of this team. My officers have been in every day since the start of the pandemic, policing our county 24-7. Uh, They're used to putting themselves in harm's way, but this last 12 months, they've also had the risk of catching COVID whilst doing their job. You cannot do policing in many occasions from two metres apart. So some of my staff have undoubtedly come down with COVID over that period. Our police staff have been brilliant. Uh, they've been in as well often, but they've worked innovatively. Some have worked from home. They've had to find new ways of working to support the organisation in its day-to-day -day business uh, and running. And they've showed huge self-reliance and resilience and ensured that policing has carried on effectively in Warwickshire during that period. And policing the COVID regulations hasn't been without its challenges. I'd like to think we have used our discretion where appropriate, but have enforced those regulations equally where necessary and important for everybody's health and well-being in the county. As we stand here today, of course, the future is looking hugely brighter, which is to be welcomed with the, the, the vaccination rollout going well and, and the rates falling. But for policing, actually, the peak in demand is still to come. As we come out and unlock this lockdown, undoubtedly, I think the demands this summer on policing will be some of the highest we've seen for many years. So let's not forget there is still a lot more to do. Uh, and finally, can I thank our High Sheriff, Joe Greenwell, uh, and his wife Anne for their unswerving support of the emergency services, the criminal justice sector uh, throughout this last 12 months. Uh, I'm sure it was not the year uh, that Joe had planned uh, and many activities I know have been curtailed, but his support throughout that period has meant a lot to the police and indeed the emergency services in the county. Thank you very much indeed. So hello, I'm Glen Burney, Chief Executive of South Warwickshire Foundation Trust and George Elliott NHS Trust. And between those two organisations, we deliver lots of healthcare services across hospitals and community settings right across Warwickshire. This has been a remarkable year for the NHS and one where our staff have worked tremendously hard under really pressured circumstances. So as part of this service, I just wanted to pay tribute to our staff who've come into work every day throughout the pandemic, often working extra shifts. Many of our staff have been redeployed into other roles and done some unfamiliar things, all in line with their training, but things that, that take them into different teams uh, and experiencing COVID. Um, and in a number of cases being the relative uh, proxy where the relative couldn't come into hospital, holding people's hands and providing that support. And we've lost some staff over the last year in, in both organisations and that has been incredibly stressful for all of the staff around them but their families uh, and friends also. But throughout this year one thing that's kept us all going has been the support that we've seen from our local communities. Uh, both the first wave and the second wave, the, the claps for carers but also the, the gifts and donations and support and good wishes that we've had from all of the people from of, right across Warwickshire. Uh, and as well as providing the support and showing their support for staff, they've also helped us with this pandemic by complying with guidelines, um, keeping social distancing and keeping the uh, demand on the NHS to the lowest possible level. But we're still fighting the pandemic. Today there are patients in all of the hospitals, there are patients in critical care, and our staff are still working incredibly hard. So we very much look forward to a period where we'll be able to have some respite. Um, but throughout my 37 years in the NHS, every single winter, every single year, our staff will work 24-7, 365 days a year in order to make sure that we keep our people safe. So great tribute to everything they do every year, but particularly this year, their efforts that they put into keeping us safe and, and managing COVID. And alongside all of that, we've delivered the biggest vaccination programme ever in the history of the NHS, and that's gone incredibly well. So there's a lot to be proud of, 
um, but also a lot of thanks to everyone, including the communities that we serve. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. None of us need to be reminded of the challenges faced by the nation in this last year. It is important, though, to recognize, as we have been doing, the extraordinary and inspirational responses to such challenges by those in the statutory and voluntary services. The people of this country rightly continue to laud and honour those on the front line in the NHS for their extraordinary and costly commitment to health care and the saving of life, a cost still being borne as hospital chaplains have been reminding me earlier this week. My medical friends, even those who have no religious faith, have described the work of the scientists who have produced these vaccines in such a short space of time as miraculous. But other services too, as we have heard from the chief constable, the police, also, of course, the prison and probation services, the fire and rescue and ambulance services, local authorities and so many voluntary bodies, church and faith communities have also risen to the challenges we have all been facing. This pandemic, with all the cost that so many have borne, has released extraordinary gifts of love and care in the community for the needy across the country. And there has been so much human tragedy with such a high loss of life and so many bereavements, so there is still deep grief among us. But in the midst of it all, there is much for which we can and do give thanks for all those who have responded to this crisis with such dedication, love and care. But today, I want to affirm especially the judiciary, our judges and all who work in the legal system, who have themselves faced enormous challenges and pressures as a result of the pandemic. The closure of courts and a pause in jury trials a huge backlog of cases resulting, many adaptations of the working of the courts, including remote and video hearings. Huge efforts have had to be made by the judiciary to ensure that the wheels of justice continue to run. It is also an opportunity to mark and honor the office and role of High Sheriff and all that it stands for. Though in this shrieval year there have of course been significant limitations, Joe and Anne have done extraordinary work, particularly in the area of employability of young people and through the inclusive apprenticeship project. Such important work enabling those who have not hitherto been able to find employment to do so. And I want now to thank God, it may sound odd coming from uh, a bishop, but to thank God for the law. I thank God for grace, of course, as a Christian, but I thank God also for the law. The law is not a necessary evil, but a necessary good, a good thing. More than that, it is important, it is essential. Why do we need it? St Paul asks this very question, why then the law, he asks. And he answers his own question, it was added because of our transgressions. We need the law because human beings do wrong. 
If we prefer a literary lens to a bib biblical one, we could do worse than read Golding's Lord of the Flies. Law is necessary for social order. The law makes freedom possible. The paradox is that anarchy, anarchy without law in the Greek, lawlessness, which implies freedom, is actually the enemy of freedom. So the law, the Torah in the Judeo-Christian tradition, is a gift of God which allows and enables freedom. In our first reading, we find Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, taking him to task for trying to arbitrate on every single case by himself, telling him he needs to choose others also to be judges. The criteria for the appointment of these judges, they are to be those who fear God, those who are trustworthy, those who hate dishonest gain. How will it work? Jethro tells Moses, let it be that every major dispute they will bring to you, but every minor dispute they themselves will judge. So we see a legal system coming into play with a hierarchy of courts, early signs of what we now take for granted. And we begin to see that there is law and there is justice. They are connected, but they are not the same. The law is to serve justice. Justice involves, as the High Sheriff's Declaration reminds us, doing right to the poor as well as to the rich. It involves treating all people equally, respecting the differences and diversity of our communities. It involves integrity and impartiality, judges judging without fear or favor. All this is in line with the Mosaic law. You shall not distort justice. You shall not be partial. You shall not accept a bribe, Deuteronomy. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great. With justice, you will judge your neighbor, Leviticus. A principle affirmed unequivocally in Magna Carta in 1215, we will sell to no man, we will not deny or defer justice or right to any man on earth. A judge in these terms cannot be bought. But the scales of justice must balance taking into account not only the needs and freedoms of the individual, but also those of the community. This is where discernment and discretion are needed to serve justice. I know a judge who, after a continuing spate of burglaries in a northeastern city, where it was clear that the burglars thought it was worthwhile to continue burgling, started to give exemplary sentences. Word got round the criminal fraternity, and soon the rate of burglary reduced by more than a half. His sentencing was merciful to the community. Now, <clears throat> now fast forward from Moses through Magna Carta to Montesquieu, 18th century French judge and philosopher, who articulated the doctrine of the separation of powers, foundational to ensuring democratic life and to the British unwritten constitution. He writes, there is no liberty if the judicial power be not separated from the legislature and the executive. No liberty if the judicial power be not separated from the legislature and the executive. Sadly, we see this lack of liberty in so many countries where the judiciary is in the pocket of tyrannical rulers. We see it in sham democracies all over the world, not least among them the superpowers 
of Russia and China. We see it right now in the ruthless erosion of democracy in Hong Kong under Chinese rule. When the separation of powers and the independence of the judiciary are trampled underfoot, oppression and injustice follow. This, sadly, is the status quo in so many countries all over the world. So we need to guard it carefully. We might want to recognize too that these bulwarks of democracy have been a little stretched nearer to home. Current controversies in Scotland suggest some blurring of the separation of powers. And not long ago, in England, we saw Supreme Court judges declaring the prorogation of Parliament without the consent of Parliament as unlawful, and as a result were branded in the popular press as enemies of the people. Such tensions serve only to reinforce the importance and value of the separation of powers, and especially the independence of the judiciary as foundational to our constitution. Finally, we have seen that the law is good and of God, but the law is not the end or goal of God's purposes. St. John, in his magisterial prologue, writes, the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Jesus comes to fulfill the law, and as our second reading has reminded us, love is the fulfilling of the law. Whoever loves others, St. Paul writes, fulfills the law. If we truly love God and our neighbor, we will not commit crimes against them. It is this, I'm sure, that prompted St. Augustine to write, Love God and do what you like. So the law and the administration of justice allow us the freedom to love our neighbors as ourselves and so to fulfill the law. In the Church of England, we pray every week for those who administer justice. So let us do so now, giving thanks for our judges, and the high sheriffs of this land for all that they do to ensure justice and peace and to build up the common good. Amen. We offer our prayers to Almighty God and our response to the phrase, Lord, hear us, is, Lord, graciously hear us. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. For the peace that comes from God alone, for the unity of all peoples and for goodwill in society, Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. For the nations of the world, for Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth, the Royal Family and for all in authority, for the armed forces of the Crown and the civil service. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. For all judges and magistrates, barristers and solicitors, for our police, probation and prison services, for all who administer justice in our communities and throughout the world. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. For our community and religious leaders, for Christopher, Bishop of Coventry, and John, Bishop of Warwick, for our cathedral in Coventry and its ministry of reconciliation, for all made in the image of God and working for the common good. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. For our region and for all communities in this area, for our Lord Lieutenant, for our local mayors and councils, 
remembering this day our High Sheriff and the High Sheriff's charities. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. For the good earth which God has given us, and for the wisdom and will to conserve it. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. For those coping with illness in this time of pandemic, for all who are bereaved and missing loved ones, for those who are feeling downcast or lost, and for all in any kind of need. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. For those who are poor and oppressed, for those unemployed or destitute, for prisoners of conscience and those held hostage, and for all who remember and care for them. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. For those who have died, those who are dying. And as we pray for those who mourn, we ask that they may be surrounded by God's strength, comfort and hope. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. So we join our prayers together for all those who are on our hearts, in the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Just before we have the national anthem, a collect for the royal family. Almighty God, fountain of all goodness, we humbly beseech thee to bless Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth, Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, Charles, Prince of Wales, and all the royal family. Endue them with thy Holy Spirit, enrich them with thy heavenly grace, prosper them with all happiness, and bring them to thine everlasting kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. 
Render no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honour everyone. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen.